Okay, our first speaker today is we have Ryan Bradley. Ryan is the director of the Mississippi Commercial Fisheries United, Inc. He's also a fisherman. He was here and around um, during Deepwater Horizon, and he's going to talk a little bit about that mixed economic impact to the fishing community and those that were stopped from fishing, but then were also hired in the Vessels Opportunity Program. So is this where I'm standing? Yeah. You can stand wherever you want to. <laughs> All right. Well, I like to walk around. I don't like to. That's okay. How y'all doing? Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So my name is Ryan Bradley. I'm a, uh, a fifth generation commercial fisherman. I grew up shrimping and oystering and fishing uh, in Mississippi and Mississippi Sound and the Gulf of Mexico. And it's really you know, all I really have known for quite a long time. So uh, it was quite an interesting time during that 2010 oil spill. We were contracted through BP and some of their subsidiaries uh, through their Festival of Opportunity program to help clean up and, and contribute to the cleanup effort. Uh, we also later contracted to another contractor to do some other oil spill cleanup work uh, in South Louisiana. So I've got some slides here today, some information about what it was like during that time, uh, the claims process, the, the cleanup process, I've got a lot of good pictures that uh, a lot of folks have never seen. Uh, there were several hundred uh, folks, uh, fishermen, individuals, local citizens employed on the uh, cleanup process during the oil spill. Probably thousands. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't have an exact number. But uh, so uh, a little bit about me. Uh, was, uh, Thank you, Melissa, for inviting me to come speak today. I'm, I'm glad to share my experience. But, uh, so I'm the director at the Mississippi Commercial Fisheries United. That's a, a nonprofit uh, group representing the interest of Mississippi's commercial fishing industry. I'm also a project coordinator with the Mississippi Coalition for Vietnamese American Fish Boats and Families. That's Ms. Tal Village. She's in the back. Back here, and she's doing a lot of great work. Uh, to help the fishing folks and fishermen in Mississippi. So we thank her. Uh, I'm also uh, a fisherman. I own a seafood company. Uh, I'm a fairly permitted reef fish fisherman. I fish offshore, snapper, grouper, amberjack. Uh, I'm on the Sea Grant Advisory Council. And last year I received an award from National Fishermen uh, that they give out once a year. So, uh, so on that day in April 20th, 2010, the big thing, there was a lot of uncertainty. Nobody knew what would come and what, and what the future would hold. We didn't know how long the oil spill would last. We didn't know how would it affect the fisheries. We didn't know what would happen to our businesses as a result. And the biggest question that we got was, is the seafood safety? And we really just could not answer that question. So immediately following the spill, I mean, uh, I had looked at my receipts there, and on, on May 10th is when they started initiating emergency payments to affected seafood businesses and fishermen throughout the South region here, the Gulf region, and. Uh, it was really an odd situation because there was no, back then, there, the, the social media wasn't as prevalent as it is today. There wasn't the Facebook and the internet and all that wasn't uh, keeping up with all this stuff as much as it is now. So through word of mouth, we got word that BP was issuing $5,000 payments to affected individuals. And so by word of mouth, it spread like fire. And by the time we showed up at the place to get our $5,000 check, the line was stretched out the building down the road for, for a, a good way. So they held true to their word. We, we showed our licenses and document and tax returns. And we walked out of there that day with a $5,000 check. Uh, everybody involved with, with the seafood business was eligible. 
That went on for several months. So eventually they established the Gulf Coast Claims Fund and they transferred for that. This this initial emergency payments, they, it was a, after a while it was starting to get abused. There were people that were uh, signing affidavits and whatnot and weren't telling the whole truth to get these payments. But uh, there was a lot of investigation that went on and people were brought to justice over it. So shortly thereafter, uh, they start holding town hall meetings about the Vessel of Opportunity program. And so it was all new to us. We've never heard anything about what is the Vessel of Opportunity. Didn't know anything about it, never participated in anything like it before. So essentially, they have a town hall meeting uh, all across the Gulf, different locations. The one we went to was in Biloxi. We show up, a lot of fishermen there, a lot of, uh, I don't think there a lot, but a couple of people representing the interest of BP. And they had contracts. They had them printed out, they had them there. And so they reviewed the contracts with us. And a lot of people signed them that day, that evening, submitted them, and you would wait. Some people got called in the form they were hired, some people didn't. So uh, the payments were based off your vessel size. So they were hiring your vessel, and the payments were between twelve hundred and three thousand dollars a day, depending on the size of your vessel. In addition, they would give you two hundred dollars a day for up to two crew members or more depending on the size of your vessel. Some, some they require three or more. Uh, they also sent us a lot of different training workshops. We, uh, it's a funny word out of the average Zoom area that has whopper term. It, that, was, that was a crazy word to me at the time, has whopper, what is that? But uh, a hazardous waste operator uh, training is, is what that was. And, uh, very interesting stuff. Uh, so our primary tasks were including searching for oil and reporting on that oil. Uh, we did do this new program recover some oil, but in the totality it was very small compared to the size of the spill. And I'll get to more on why we didn't recover as much here shortly. So I, I just did this in here. This is what, what the contract looked like when they when we signed up. Uh, it was several pages and, and they had it all figured out and uh it was a uh, I, I just like to share a story on, on how my family came to be contracted with bp it was uh they were calling folks randomly we didn't really know if we were going to be selected uh, i had a friend of mine that was hired on and he happened to give me the name of a guy that was coordinating for bp and so we called them up, and uh, this was after probably two or three weeks of waiting to see if we would be hired. And he was over here in Mobile, at the, the convention center, and that's where the command center was. And he said, come over here, bring your contract. So we got in truck, we, we headed over there, gave the contract to him. He said, wait in the lobby for a few minutes. And it took about five or ten minutes, and he called us. We got a call and said, you've been hired. You're, you're activated on this program immediately and so we we're lucky we we're fortunate there were a lot of people that were real commercial fishermen people that needed to be put to work and they never were hired throughout the whole program so uh it was an interesting time uh there was really no rhyme or reason as to who they were selecting or why but uh very interesting process they had there so some of the tasks that we participated in and conducted during this time was uh, one we were inspecting and reporting missing or damaged boom. Uh, even before I was hired on, they had already sent out teams, specialized teams that had specialized training to go and deploy the boom. And I'll show some maps here in a minute of Mississippi Sound where all the boom they had around the islands. So then our second mission was to search for and report for oil. So 
First, we would start by checking the booms around the islands, around the mouths of the harbors, and then we would head out further and we would search for oil. That was our job every day. Is we would just go out and we'd look for oil. Uh, and I brought this is one of the things that they gave me. <laughs> Not much, but uh, it was just an all weather journal. And that was my job was to write down the coordinates of anything I saw, any oil that I found, any uh, boom that needed replacing. And so we'd write that down, log it, and we'd scan that at the end of the day, and we'd send it to our uh, coordinator uh, every day. He wanted to see that. And they were, when we reported, they would send folks out the next day or that evening to go and inspect and fix it. Uh, so we would also report, you know, Dead Sea Turtles and, and whatnot. Uh, there was also a big decontamination area set up on the water and on land. And so we always had to make sure every day that if we got into oil, we went through the decontamination process. And uh, they reported, like I said, they wanted to see, it's the craziest thing they demanded, they wanted to see these logs every day, but we never got any feedback on it. You know, like, what, you know, did you do anything about it? Did you, did you go find us oil? We never heard nothing back, but they just said, look, just keep sending those reports. So we did. So these are some of the training cards they gave me. I went to, there's a challenge, three or four different trainings. Uh, they sent me all over the place doing the trainings. Uh, in our area in Mississippi, I, at the time, I was one of the only has walker trained uh, responders. And that meant that only the has walker people could handle oil. If you didn't have that training, they didn't want you touching the oil, doing nothing with it. So I was uh, overseeing a group of about a, a dozen people, and we would um, actively search out and seek and remove oil. And I'm going to show you some pictures here in a minute of oil we encountered. So this was something they gave us. I just scanned a copy. I brought the original folders they gave me. So these are two folders that they gave me during that training, uh, during that time, whoops. And uh, I'm gonna leave them on the table there if anybody wants to take a look at them. But, uh, you know, we were trained on how to deploy that boom if we needed to, how to fix it. And then we had lots of maps of where all the, the boom should be and where it was located. But, this is just some interesting stuff that they gave us during that time. I'll be anybody wants to look at it. So this is a map of all the boom, and where they have the red dots everywhere around these islands, that's at the time where they had already had placed boom. And so they had a lot of boom out there, and it was pretty effective in stopping the oil from reaching the shore around these islands, and I'll show you some pictures. Of course, once the winds and the waves picked up, it became ineffective. But uh, on a good calm day, it was uh, pretty effective. And so here you can see, stretched out, and this is actually something that we reported. If you see this boom is washed up on the island here, so that had to be fixed. So those are the type of things that we are looking for and reporting and, and fixing. Yeah, so, so here's a picture of some wall on the boom. As you can see in front of it, all the nasty stuff would collect, coalesce right there up next to it, but it was relatively clear on the backside. So it was working on a good calm day. But uh, you can see that brown look like uh, chocolate milk or fudge. Or, we've seen several different shades of colors. The wall is very very intriguing to me at the time. I'd never seen nothing like it. And here's another shot where we don't know what all this white stuff will be you know, particulates, uh, plankton, uh, who knows. But you can see it around the edges of brown and tar balls here. So here's a little better shot you can see as it starts to weather and break down. It, it, you know, we could never really tell if it was sprayed with dispersant or or what the deal was. Uh, but uh, you would see it 
start to break down smaller. If you look close on this, there's little small individual droplets in there. Then we started coming across big, big patches. And this was the most beautiful color. I hate to say that, but <laughs> it, it was just a bright orange copper. Uh, it was beautiful. But uh, it, just sitting in the sea in our waterways, this was south of Ship Island. Uh, when I took this picture here. So uh, in state waters, in Mississippi state waters, so we did have some pretty big uh, oil mats that came in to our state waters for sure. Uh, here's another shot of it. It's very interesting the texture. It was just really amazing to look at it and see it. And uh, interesting color there. And you can see starting to weather bubble up. It would start to crack like mud, like dried mud. It would start to, to, to go. But, uh, here's another big, big mat, and this was actually pretty close to shore. But then it comes to cleaning up this stuff, and we started to see it. We really didn't have the tools to actually clean it up. So, being fishermen, we started to devise whatever we had available. To clean this stuff up because we couldn't just let it uh, go without trying to at least make an attempt to clean it up. So we fashioned stuff like this. So we took a scoop net with a uh, oyster sack and tied it on there, and it worked for the most part. And here you can see a fella. He's uh, working on that. You see, he has no respirator. Uh, he does have his tie net suit on and gloves, but uh, we were never given respirators during the time that I worked. And still, here's another shot trying to scoop that stuff out. And we did this uh, a good bit. It, it was interesting because different pieces of oil you would come across were different colors. And I, I don't know if that's a result of weathering or just different uh, types of oil. So that was a, this was right off of the mouth of Long Beach about half a mile off the beach. And, and I'm gonna show you a picture here. This is where it was at, that, that big map we just seen, that's how close we were to the shore. So we were kind of like the last defense from saving this oil from hitting the shore. So uh, a lot of good work, a lot of a, a team effort, all these folks and people worked together. Everybody had common, nobody wanted to see this stuff hit the shore. So we worked hard, uh, we took a lot of uh, there's, there's a little up close, but so we worked about uh, 70, 80 days straight, and it was very interesting because they wanted you to work seven days a week, and the money was really good. They were paying pretty well, so you didn't want to miss a day, and it that in itself became a strain during the heat of the summer, seven days a week out there on the water. You're losing a lot of weight. You're sweating not every day. And it was, it was the challenge to keep your health up during that time. I know I lost a lot of weight during that time. But uh, here's another crew. Eventually, some of that oil did make it on the shore and was washing up on the rocks. They had smaller crews that would try to clean that stuff up. Here, here's just another example again of uh, I wanted to show makeshift. Uh, a net, a net to scoop this oil out of a crawfish sack tied onto a scoop net. Anything we could come up with to try to scoop this stuff out while we were trying it. We really didn't have any uh, right tools to do it effectively. So this is a decon barge. Every day we would have to run our boats by here. They would, they would spray us. They had to pick the They could pick your whole boat up out the water and, and, and clean it off. Uh, this is another type of, of boom that we worked to deploy and test is uh, we would anchor it off in one spot and, and stretch it out and anchor it off again. And it was pretty effective. Uh, eventually, the, the food program came to an end. Uh, most of the folks were deactivated from the program. And, uh, then I went to work uh, in Hopedale, Louisiana. This is in the this is some living quarters in the Mississippi River Gulf Island. 
we were contracted to work on an oil stream vessel and the, the see this apparatus on the front and lower down into the water and you can really just drop through it and skim up some oil. Unfortunately, by the time when these were deployed, they about capped well. So uh, it was interesting during that time, uh, BP was sued by a prominent Louisiana fisherman uh, over the vessel of opportunity program. And BP wound up having to pay about a month's worth of wages uh, to everybody because of a uh, contract dispute. Uh, so we had the claims facility. Eventually, uh, they transferred to that. Uh, they offered final claims. Uh, you could do a quick selling it for five thousand or twenty-five thousand, uh, or you could do a partial payment and continue to pursue. Uh, then it was eventually transferred to the uh, Deepwater Horizon Claims Center under a different program. Uh, there was some good final payments. They come back with a, a supplement eventually. And I guess that's my last slide. But uh, I know I'm short on time here. But uh, so since then, uh, here recently, we've had a another distribution of funds from the Transocean Settlement and it was minimal payments for folks but during this time it was important for us to be, have this opportunity to work uh, during this time because there was so much uncertainty nobody knew what the future would hold and to have the security from working on this job and the income it really helped a lot of folks out and all all the people that were participating in, in the program did a heck of a job. I mean, you see what they what they were doing out there, what they were dealing with, and uh, you know, so a lot of people were, were fishermen, uh, charter fishermen, commercial fishermen, recreational fishermen, and they were passionate about protecting uh, the waters there. And so, uh, I've heard a lot about well, the, the food program wasn't it was a waste. It was. You know, they rallied, there was a lot of optics behind it. Uh, BP was trying to buy some, some good publicity, and they did that. But uh, we couldn't imagine, we couldn't fathom if they were to hire all these people from out of state or from up north, or that wouldn't have went over well politically. So it was the right thing to do to hire the local fishermen. Uh, going forward, I don't know that there will ever be another vessel of opportunity program to this magnitude. Maybe it's something that we should look at to try to have formed up a, a structure to it. So if we do have another event, it can be a little bit more streamlined, robust, and uh, more effective. We didn't quite get all the tools we needed to do the job in time, and, and so we did the best we could with the resources we were given. But uh, overall, I just want to end by saying that uh, we did have a pretty good downturn in our seafood industry since then. Uh, the, the, the claims and the vessel of opportunity helped these fishermen to get by for many years after the spill. But we are still paying for the oil spill today in terms of lost seafood production. Our oyster industry is at uh, just devastating levels right now. It's not recovered since BP. Uh, we paid the price of people Ask it is the seafood safe to eat for five, six, seven, eight years after the spill. They were still asking is the seafood safe to eat, and that's hard to quantify and measure. And so, uh, that, that's my story. I wish I had some more time, but uh, if you have any questions, glad to answer or we push me uh, at during break. So. So oh, thank you. I'm going to have you be on a, on a panel to get some questions afterwards, yeah. okay. but thanks, Ryan. <laughs>